Thanks a lot and thanks for inviting me. So this is joint work with uh, Moses Charikar and Arvindan. <coughs> so I'm sure all of you have heard a lot of this since the morning, but let me just give a couple of minutes of background about what we are doing here. So we have data from various sources. So you might have a bunch of documents, some speech data, some sets of points in the plane, and so on. And uh, the basic question you ask in learning is, is there a simple explanation for all this data? So in other words, can you think of all this data as coming from a model with a small number of parameters? So that's the general question we want to understand. And this has been very successful. For example, topic models for documents and hidden marker models for speech and so on. So often they help you get a better understanding of the data you have. So I'm going to give an example of topic models for documents, partly because it's, the sim it's one of the simplest models. And uh, in its simplest version, uh, you think of a document as being about precisely one topic, and uh, you think of a topic as a distribution over words. Okay? So just to give an example, you might have a bunch of topics, so say sports, wildlife, and so on. Each topic is a distribution over all the words in your dictionary. So like wildlife might have some probability of seeing all these ones. And uh, the property here is that these things add up to one, for example. All right. So this is the simplest topic model. And here, the parameters you have are, the uh, firstly, the weights for the topics. This is given a random document. What is the probability that it's about topic i? So I will call that wi. Okay. So the w sum up to 1. And for each topic i, you have a probability vector pi, which is, uh, which is the row of this one. Okay. And uh, how can you generate a topic in this topic model? So let's say you want to generate a document with r words. Then first you pick a topic with probability proportional to these w's. Okay. So let's say you pick topic 2. And uh, you pick R words independently according to the probability distribution P2. Okay. So this is the model for generating topics, uh, for generating documents. Okay. And uh, the underlying assumption behind all these methods is that uh, if you pick a random, wo random document from your set of documents that you have, and you randomly sample R words, then the output you see is roughly the same as picking an R-word document according to this model. Okay. So that's when you say that this is a good model for, for the set of documents you have. And, uh, and the goal in all of this area is uh, generally assuming that there is a good model for your data. Then how do you find, these make, uh, how do you find the parameters, that is the Ws and the probability vectors P? So what does this have to do with tensors? And uh, as we saw in the previous talks, uh, the simplest way in which you see tensors sh showing up is to ask yourself the question, so let's say I pick three random words from a random document. What is the probability that the first word is some i, second word is j, and the third word is k? And uh, you'll see that this is precisely equal to, so the calculation shows the probability that if you pick a topic r, so you do that with probability wr. And given that, probability of seeing word 1, word 2, and word 3 is exactly the quantity that I wrote. <coughs> okay. And you can already see this has some tensor field to it. So if you now form a tensor whose ijth entry is precisely this quantity, uh, then you can write this out as uh, sum over r, wr times pr out of product, pr out of product, pr. And uh, so this uh, illustrates why finding parameters is uh, essentially the same as tensor decomposition. Okay. And uh, this is generally the recipe for tensor methods in mixture models. Uh, and it's been used also before the machine learning works. It has also been used in the algebraic statistics literature. There are also older references than these. And uh, the general outline of these methods is that first you estimate a tensor whose decomposition somehow allows you to read off the model parameters. And you do this estimation from the data that you have. And once you have that, 
Once you have that tensor, you can then decompose the tensor and then you can find the decomposition. And uh, this has found many applications. So, you, uh, so for example, mixtures of Gaussians, hidden Markov models. Recently, Rong showed us uh, about crabs. So, yeah. So, okay. So, all this sounds like a nice coherent story. So, so what? I mean, are we done now, right? So, there are actually two big caveats in this. So, first is the question of efficiency. So, generally in computer science, the aim is to find polynomial time algorithms for decomposition. Okay. So, let's say you are given this tensor T, which is sum of outer products. So, I absorbed the W into one of the P's. And the question is, can you find, uh, can you find these vectors P? And uh, you want to do this efficiently in time polynomial and all the in the number of parameters involved. Okay. And uh, another very important thing for in in applications is that our algorithm needs to be robust. Okay. So in the sense, uh, you need to be able to work with a noisy tensor. What do I mean by that? So. If you remember in this topic models, we estimated each entry of the tensor by looking at a whole bunch of documents. Right? So if you take n samples of your documents, then uh, typically you'll have a 1 over square root n entry per, per, per entry of the tensor. And uh, in practice, we are only allowed a small enough number of samples. And so dealing with error is important. So the goal in uh, so the goal for us computationally is the following. So we have a target accuracy epsilon to which you want to learn all the parameters, and uh, let's say you can find this tensor up to an error which is epsilon over polynomial in n. So by taking the number of samples to be reasonably large, uh, to be a fairly large polynomial, you can ensure that this happens. And uh, using this, you want to infer the parameters up to an error epsilon. So you, uh, usually you can try different R's. So, yeah. so for now I'll assume that I know the R. So what is one case in which we can solve both these problems? So, uh, so that is uh, one of the main success stories that we have. It is the full rank case. So let's say you have a tensor whose uh, decomposition is PR, PR out of product like this, and you, are, you know this tensor up to some error. Now let's define the matrix P to be the n times R matrix whose columns are these vectors PR. Okay. And uh, so, the, so the theorem here is that uh, if all the columns of this matrix are linearly independent in a strong sense, that is, uh, you have that the rth singular value of this matrix is at least 1 over a polynomial in n. I am confused. P ground, uh, P, the big P is defined uh, from the small P. Yes, so uh, big P is a matrix whose columns are the small P's. So it's not and then you already know the small P, so why? Oh. No, no, no. So, so we don't know what this thing is. We just uh, know that there are, a, there are some parameters. You estimated the tensor from your documents. So you know this T, but you don't know what the P's are. And that is the problem. So. But if you don't know how you can estimate P if you don't know, I don't understand. No, no I'm saying you can estimate this T if you don't know the parameters P. And what I will say is that if the true P's happen to satisfy this property, that uh, sigma r is more than 1 over poly, then you can recover them. What is sigma r? Oh, so, so sorry. Yeah, so I just thought uh, sigma r is the rth smallest uh, right singular value. So, so it is. Uh, so unfold, unfold it to r by matrix and assume that it has full rank and also there's the lowest singular value. The lowest singular value is reasonably big. So it's full rank in a slightly strong sense. And it's drawn with some... So, so it's not unfolded, you know? It's just a column. So it's just... Uh, so P is this matrix, which uh, is N times R. 
and its ith column is this vector pi. But is the pi one what you want to find? So I, I, it seems. Yeah, exactly. So, so the slightly cyclic thing here is that. Uh, ah, it's just a. I see. It's just a yeah, yeah, it's a condition. If the true values happen to satisfy this condition, then there is an algorithm to recover them. So you could be unfortunate and they might not satisfy this condition. So. Okay. So is, the, is that clear? So is it, again, I'm just wondering, so do you know what the rank of the tensor is going to be or do you assume that it is? So yeah, in practice, you usually try different values, but for now, let's assume we know what it is. And uh, we know what it is, and uh, we also know that if you build this matrix, then uh, then this matrix has a good smallest single value. So I'm uh, okay. So so I'm just trying to. So you, do, do you want to do exact decomposition? Or do you want to find some tensor of small rank that is close? I guess what is the. So in this case, I want to find each of the p's up to an accuracy parameter. I see. So and you want to find a small rank tensor that is near to your target one. And more importantly, the decomposition itself is also near to your target decomposition. So not just yeah. So the, the capital R is it smaller than n? Yeah. yeah. So in this case, uh, the figure is a bit of is quite bad. Otherwise you, won't have this Otherwise, you will not have this condition. Right, so that's why I call this the full rank case, where you have full column rank. Just the picture is kind of tricky. Right, right. Soon we'll move to these. <laughs> so, yeah. So, you know, actually what you're talking about is something called a separation rank in computational quantum chemistry. Uh -huh. uh, so the thing is, uh, given a fixed epsilon, you want to find the smallest r so that t is uh, within as an r term approximately. Right, right, right. Epsilon, right. This is what you want. Do you want R to be the smallest with, with it once you fix epsilon? Uh, no, so those kind of conditions will come to in a bit. Okay. So that is, so are you talking about the spark? Or something? No, not that. No. So if okay. I epsilon, if I fix epsilon, okay, uh -huh. what is the smallest R so that you have a decomposition like this? That is the separation rank, but that is not what you oh, want. Oh, I see. That's not what I want. So I want it for all the columns. So for, for all the piece that you want to find, uh, I want this matrix P to be, uh, so to, be to, to have columns that are full rank in a strong sense. He wants to recover so, all the piece. Yeah, so this is the... Uh, I see, I see, yeah. I see. Okay, so you assume that T has a decomposition like this. Yeah. yeah. So if T happened to have a decomposition like this, then you can recover it efficiently. So actually, that will be a general flavor of all the results uh, that I'm going to say, that uh, if the decomposition P satisfies certain explicitly stated conditions, then I will be able to recover the parameters. And uh, this is true for all the results uh, that we know of about tensor decomposition. I don't, I don't understand. So what, what's, um, if we have, what's the difference between what you're saying and, and, uh, and like Hag is, is saying. So uh, if you have, how do you know what is your target, uh, target decomposition that you want to? Oh, uh, we don't. So the target decomposition is something that, uh, I mean, it's somehow given to us by nature or something like this. So we see the document. Close. Right. Well, I guess the question, if, you, if the composition is unique, then you can talk about it, right? I, Th then you can think of trying to recover it. Yeah, I mean, if the composition is not unique, then it would be difficult to know how to get close. This is, this is correct. Right. Yeah, I mean, so in general, you don't know the decomposition beforehand. The goal is to find it. So, but you know the tensor. And you believe there is a decomposition which satisfies some good properties, and then you want to find that decomposition. So we just want to approximate this tensor with some small rank that's, that's the... Uh, if there is a unique solution, that would also solve the problem, yes. But it's a good point that even with zero, zero noise, the prerequisite is that the decomposition should be unique. Right, mm -hmm. right in some sense. So if there is a unique decomposition, then if you approximate... This is 
from the so data facts and connections, but with an additional assumption that the, the composition is unique. Uh, so that itself won't suffice. So we, you will need uh, this stronger assumption on the decomposition. Okay. So <laughs> having stated all this, I should say that this is an old result. So this has been discovered many times. And uh, I think the earliest, uh, earliest known thing is due to Harshman. So... So the result I stated here, it's uh, quite strong. So it says that uh, if you have r smaller than n and you have this non-degeneracy property, then you can efficiently recover the decomposition. Uh, but, it, but it requires the strong non-degeneracy property. And uh, the question is, can you hope to recover parameters even under weaker conditions? And in particular, if you have the number of parameters you want to recover to be more than n, the dimension, then uh, can you can you still hope to recover the parameter? And uh, in this talk, I will be concerned with identifiability, so which is uh, somewhat like uniqueness in some sense. And uh, the, the informal theorem here, which I'll prove, is that uh, if, the Kruska, if something called Kruskal's rank condition holds, then you can, you can, I mean, it is possible to recover the decomposition up to any desired accuracy epsilon. So this will be the main result of the talk. And uh, so the, so I, there's no known algorithm for this, just assuming the Kruskal's rank condition. And uh, that is like, that is an interesting open problem. So the difference, uh, let me point out one thing about the difference between this, uh, about this result and the kind of things we saw earlier in the workshop, which is about uh, uniqueness and under generic assumptions. So here, firstly, I have explicit conditions on the decomposition, such that if it holds, then you're able to recover the tensor. And secondly, uh, so now I'm, I'm saying something about recovering a tensor, even if you know it up to a certain small amount of noise. So that, I think, is the, the difference in viewpoints. So first, let me talk about uh, Kruskal's rank conditions that I mentioned before and uh, introduce what is called Kruskal's theorem. Okay. And the general goal of uh, this theorem is to find conditions under which the decomposition is unique. Okay. So, and the conditions will involve these matrices A, B, and C these vectors A, B, and C. And so an in interesting notion that, is, that Kruskal introduced, it's, uh, it also later has been introduced in different communities. It's what's, called, what's now called the Kruskal rank. And uh, for a matrix, for an n times r matrix, its rank is the largest integer k such that every k columns are linearly independent. Uh, so if you think of, uh, of a matrix like this, so you want every k columns to be linearly independent. So note that it is much stronger than the usual notion of rank, which is essentially you want some, some k columns to be linearly independent. And it's also related to some notions that are studied in compressed sensing. And uh, Kruskal's theorem says that if you have a tensor and... Uh, so from its decomposition, let's say you define these matrices A, B, and C as we did before. So, so you define A to be a matrix whose columns are these AIs, B to be a matrix whose columns are the BIs, and so on. Then if the, if the ranks of these matrices satisfy this inequality, so you have the sum of the Kruskal ranks to be smaller than twice the rank of this tensor, it's the number of terms in the decomposition, plus two, then uh, this is the unique decomposition for the tensor. So this was Kruskal's theorem. And yeah, I'll come to that, yeah. So, <laughs> okay. All right. And uh, the goal of our result is uh, to get a noisy version of this. Okay? So let's say you, you know a tensor only up to a certain noise. So can we say that you can still recover something close to the exact decomposition? Okay. 
So let's say you have a tensor T that is uh, as before, but you have this noise term. And uh, we want to find these A, B, and C up to some small error. And uh, the notion that turns out to be useful for us is what we call, it's a natural generalization of the Kruskal rank. So there you require every k columns to be linearly independent. Now you can, uh, now you want every k columns uh, to be reasonably well conditioned. Okay? And uh, the condition number is just uh, the ratio of the top to the bottom singular values. So, so what this condition says is uh, if you take any uh, k columns, and if you restrict to this submatrix, let me call it, uh, so this is matrix A, let's say, and uh, this is some set of columns S, then uh, if you look at this ratio, the sigma max of A restricted to S divided by sigma min of A restricted to S, uh, then this quantity is at most tau. Okay? So this is called uh, the Kruskal rank with respect to this parameter tau. Is infinity, yeah. Okay. And we'll be interested usually in the case when tau is polynomial in n. No, tau is, tau is not infinity because you, you are not allowed to. A, any finite number. <laughs> any. You are not uh, because uh, all of them are linearly independent, same as sigma minimum is. Yeah. You know? It's as, I mean, it's just bounded. Okay. So, so assuming this definition, so our, uh, our theorem is bas is roughly the following. So, if you have a tensor up to a certain amount of noise, uh, then the decomposition is uh, unique. I'll get to what it means to be robustly unique in a bit. If you have this property that these robust Kruskal ranks add up to at least two R plus two, okay. so this is a natural analog of uh, the Kruskal's theorem. Okay, and uh, so just to explain, so what is it that we are trying to do? So let's say we have a rank K tensor, call it T. And what we are saying is that if you take any other tensor that is rank K and is close enough to T, then the decompositions of these two tensors are roughly equal. So, so in particular, if, uh, if you give me any error parameter epsilon, there is an epsilon prime that is polynomially related to epsilon, such that if t and t prime are epsilon prime close to each other, then the decompositions are epsilon close. And uh, this is true up to a permutation. So there is a way of mapping the vectors of one decomposition to the other, such that they are epsilon close. So this is the main gist of our theorem. And I'm going to state it formally, in which case it looks a little more daunting. So, so you have two, uh, two tensors, T and T prime. Both are rank K. And uh, you know that uh, they are epsilon prime close to each other. And uh, the hypothesis is that the original tensor T has a decomposition that satisfies the Kruskal's theorem, the Kruskal's condition. So you have... Uh, k of a plus k of b plus k of c bigger than 2r plus 2, then if you take any other tensor that's close to this tensor, its decomposition will be close to it. So any questions about this? And uh, so this is essentially a, just a way of saying what uh, Moses just pointed to, that uh, you can only hope to recover this decomposition up to a permutation because you can always permute the terms of the decomposition. So some remarks before I move on to how we prove this. So firstly, note that uh, the conditions that we had in this theorem are only about one of the decompositions. Okay. So you had this uh, decomposition of T, and uh, all our conditions are only about this decomposition. And uh, you don't really need anything about this A prime, B prime, and C prime. You need something mild, but that's a technical point. 
And an interesting implication, for example, for this is that uh, if you take some tensor T, whose decomposition is good in that it satisfies these Kruskal conditions, then any other tensor that is close to T cannot have a rank that is smaller than R. Because uh, I mean, in some sense, if you're close enough to T, then uh, you must have a decomposition that's close to the decomposition of this, and therefore it cannot have a smaller. And uh, another thing which I'll not state is that uh, this also generalizes to higher order tensors. So, and this is in the same way that as a result of de that uh, that's an extension of Kruskal's theorem. So, the theorem, the robust version also generalizes in the exact same way. Okay. And uh, before getting to the proof, uh, I just wanted to know that the main difficulty is handling this, uh, handling a one over poly n noise. So remember, we had these epsilon and epsilon prime in the theorem. And uh, so if we are uh, epsilon prime close, we want the decompositions to be epsilon close. And uh, the goal is to somehow relate these two by only a polynomial factor. And that turns out to be the difficult part. And somehow, if you naturally follow Kruskal's proof, you get an exponential bond. So you have to do something more to get to a polynomial. Why do you care about polynomials? Okay. So, yeah, and the general reason we care about this is that uh, we can obtain tensors only up to a 1 over polynomial accuracy, and uh, that's why, and, and to get that accuracy, you need polynomially many samples, and so that's why we care about handling 1 over poly n noise, because usually you assume your running time and the number of samples you have is only polynomial. All right. So let me give a brief overview of the proof. And uh, and I'll assume some simplifying assumptions that uh, you, you have these uh, n cross r matrices, a, b, and c, which are in the decomposition. And uh, I will assume that their ranks are exactly equal to n. What that means is that if you take any n columns, so now you have a matrix that's n cross r, and r I'm thinking of as something slightly bigger than n. And I'm assuming that any n columns of these are linearly independent in a strong way. Okay? So, so uh, they have a reasonably big condition number, at least 1 over a polynomial in n. And uh, the Two, there are two main steps in the proof, and the first one is, uh, is essentially showing that. Uh, so first, you show by you show that a prime is a scale permutation of a, b prime is a scale permutation of b, and so on. Then you show that the permutations are all equal. So uh, you'll see this in a bit. And uh, it turns out that the crux of the proof is the first part, which is essentially showing that a and a prime are permutations of each other, b and b prime. Are permutations. So recall that, uh, so our hypothesis, just to write it down, is uh, we have tensor T, which is which has a decomposition. I'll just write it as A, B, C. So this just means Tensor T prime, this is this has a decomposition A prime, D prime, and we know that T minus T prime is small. And uh, from this, from these conditions, we want to say that uh, A is a permutation of A prime, B is a permutation of B prime, and so. Okay. so so let, uh, just to illustrate the proof, uh, let me first make a simplifying assumption. So I'll, uh, let's assume that uh, you, uh, that no two columns of A prime are parallel. Okay? Turns out you don't need to assume this. You can actually show this. But uh, let's assume this. And uh, so the crux of uh, Kruskal's proof is in, show, is in considering the spaces spanned by a subset of columns of these matrices. Okay. 
So, so you have two matrices A and A prime, and you want to show that their columns are permutations of each other. And the goal is to do this by looking at spans of subsets of the column. So let's define the span of A sub S as uh, exactly the span of the columns indexed by this set S. And uh, roughly speaking, the main claim of uh, Kruskal's proof is the following. So you, you look at sets of size n minus 1. So you look at n minus 1 different indices. And the claim is that if you look at the span of the columns in A prime of these indices, so this is the span of a bunch of columns of A prime, then it contains at least n minus 1 columns of A. So just to draw a picture, you have A like this, and A prime is another matrix. You look at a bunch of columns of A prime, and you look at their span, and it contains at least n minus 1 columns of A. Okay. So this will be the claim. And uh, the result will be that if this is true, then uh, you can also get this theorem for smaller S's. So assuming you can show this claim for uh, for sets S of size n minus 1, then you can also show this for every S. And note that if you can show this claim for, S e for S's of size 1, then what this means is that for every column of A prime, you have some column in A that is parallel to it. And uh, this is the claim roughly that we wanted to show. So this is the general outline of the proof. And uh, all right. So let me first show that this base case holds, which is that if you take a set of size n minus one, and uh, then if you look at n minus one columns of A prime, then uh, the space spanned by them contains at least n minus one columns of A. So this is the base case, and uh, so we have these A and A prime, and we are looking at n minus one columns of A prime. So note that uh, we know that uh, T and T prime are very close to each other. So if you looked at uh, the decomposition, so you know that so the, the left side is T and the right side is T prime, and we know they are both very close to each other. So what does this mean? So if you look at any vector W, and you take the inner product of this tensor in the leftmost component with W, then you get exactly this term. So the left-hand side inner product with W is precisely this. So you have uh, inner product of this vector W with AR, and uh, you have BR out of product CR. So we know that uh, if these two tensors are roughly equal, then their dot products with any W are also equal. So, so you have an equality of this form. And uh, this, is, uh, this is where the trick comes in. So let's say you pick W to be orthogonal to all the columns in S. So recall that S was a set of size n minus 1, and we are living in n, n dimensions. So there's always some column that's orthogonal to all the columns in, uh, in S. So if you, if you picked such a W, then what happens to the right side? So the right side has inner products of W with these ARs as the coefficients. So all, uh, so, so all of these n minus 1 coefficients that correspond to s would vanish. So the number of terms that you have on the right side is at most n over 3 plus 1. The uh, plus 1 is because the n minus 1 of them were 0, and uh, there were a total of 4 n over 3 terms. And uh, so the key observation that Kruskal made is that uh, so this rank condition essentially implies that the same must be true on the left-hand side. Okay? So the rank condition, is you should think of it as saying that somehow these Bs and Cs are in general position in some sense. And then if you had a sum of more than n over 3 terms, and uh, they added up to a rank n over 3 matrix, uh, somehow you get a contradiction, because uh, you have more than n over 3 terms, which are somehow in general position, adding up to a rank smaller than n over 3 matrix. 
So this is the idea of uh, this is the key idea in Kruskal's proof. And uh, so what does this mean? So this means that uh, if, for this w, you must have at most n over three terms on the left side, which are non-zero, whose coefficients are non-zero. And this means that uh, there are at least n minus one columns a r that uh, are also orthogonal to w. And being orthogonal to w essentially means you are in the space spanned by the by the a s. So so this is the just of the proof for the for the case s being n minus one. And uh, so we want to show this for every s. And in particular, if we can show this for s equals one, we would be done. So the natural thing is to do some kind of a downward induction. So you start uh, now with let's look at the case when s is n minus two and see what it happens. Okay. So let's start with some s of size n minus two, and the uh, idea is to use induction. So let's define s sub i to be a set obtained by adding one new index to s. Okay. So so you have some set of size n minus two, and you add one new index, and uh, there are n, roughly n over three such choices because uh, you have n minus two things, and you have a total of four n over three columns. And uh, so, so by the inductive hypothesis, what you know is that for each SI, there is a set of at least n minus one columns of A that lie in the span of this A prime sub SI. So this was the inductive hypothesis. So let's call this set of columns Ti. So these are exactly the columns of A that lie in the span of this uh, A prime sub SI. And uh, somehow the idea of this uh, and the key observation about these sets Ti is that if you look at two different i and j, that is, you take some set S, uh, first expand it to i, then you add j to it. So if you have any column in the set Ti intersection Tj, then that column must also be contained in the span of just A sub S. Okay. Of, uh, Uh, it's better to just uh, explain what is roughly going on. So, so we are trying to use this inductive hypothesis, and what we know is that uh, if you have, if you take uh, subsets of columns of A prime, then for subsets of size n minus one, you have enough columns in A that are that lie in those spaces. Now we are taking two different subsets of A uh, of columns of A prime obtained by looking at s and adding i and obtained by s and adding j. And for each of these, you have some columns uh, in A that are contained in those spaces. And what we are saying that is that uh, any column in this intersection must actually be in the span of this A sub s. And uh, so, so this turns out to, if you write it out, you can easily show, this proof, uh, show that this must be true. And uh, but the key observation is the following. So if you have, uh, so let's say you denote by T uh, the set of columns that are contained in this, uh, that are in the span of A prime sub S. Okay. So this is the set that you want to show is reasonably big. So for the inductive claim. So, so what, we sh what we showed here is that if you took any two different I and J's, then columns in the intersection of these two um, must all lie in T. And uh, this is what is called the sunflower family in combinatorics. So you have a bunch of sets Ti's such that the intersection of any two of them is precisely equal to the set T. Okay. So you should think of these Ti's as the union of the score plus one of the petals. Okay. So all of them contain the core and uh, each of them has a disjoint pattern. Okay. And uh, using the fact that each set has size at least n minus one, uh, the goal is to show by a counting argument that, you, that the core must have size at least n minus two. 
And uh, this turns out to be quite simple to prove, so let me not go into this for the sake of time. And uh, it's, a, it's a simple counting argument that shows that you must have enough columns that are in the core. In some this completes the proof. OK. And uh, now let me just uh, mention why showing that Showing a robust version of this is tricky. So recall that uh, so we had we were looking at these spaces spanned by subsets of columns, and uh, we were proceeding by some kind of a downward induction. So first we said for all sets of size n minus one, you have enough columns in A that are also there, and eventually we want to get down to sets of size one. Now the problem with this inductive kind of an approach is that. Uh, so if you just try to mimic this proof, what you obtain is that uh, if you have the claim for uh, sets of size n minus 1 with an error parameter epsilon, then you can prove this for n minus 2 with an error of only epsilon times n. So what exactly do I mean by the error? So we want, uh, so now our permutation lemma is a robust form of this, where uh, for set, uh, where we still look at the spans of subsets of columns of A prime. Uh, but we want these columns to not exactly lie in that space, but be ap but approximately lie in that space. Okay. And uh, that's where the error parameter epsilon comes in. And uh, it turns out that uh, if you just try to follow the previous proof, you'll lose a factor of roughly n in each step. And uh, this is an inductive proof where we want to go down n steps. So you end up getting an exponential dependence on the exponentially large uh, increase in epsilon. Exponential or factorial? Yeah, you actually get n to the n, so it's more than, even worse, yeah. Yeah. So, so this is why you can't uh, simply mimic this proof, and uh, so that's why. So, so what this means is that unless you started with an extremely good solution, you cannot, uh, you cannot just do apply this technique. And, uh, but it turns out that we can still uh, use the same outline. So instead of basically following this proof, you can argue in a more combinatorial way. I won't go into the details. But uh, you essentially need a stronger sunflower argument. And uh, using this, you can actually fix and show that you can, uh, you can prove this theorem with only a polynomial uh, loss in the epsilon. Okay. So I won't uh, go into the details because they are rather technical and probably not very illuminating. Okay. So with this, uh, let me conclude the proof of this uh, of the robust lemma, and uh, I'll point out some general open directions and things which I feel are interesting, especially to, I mean, to this workshop. So the first question is, of course, uh, are there polynomial time algorithms just assuming Kruskal's condition, okay. not assuming something like full rank, as I mentioned earlier in the talk? So, so that would be a very interesting, very interesting contribution. Okay, and uh, there's also this question that Sham talked about, and I guess Rong alluded to, where. Uh, can we use, uh, suppose we are actually interested in these uh, mixture model type problems, then can we use tensor-based algorithms in the case when R is bigger than N? So here it turns out a lot can be done. You'll hear more about this in the next talk. And, uh, there are also more recent works assuming what's called the incoherence. Okay. And uh, what I feel is, uh, is a nice direction is if we can use uh, the generic results that are known in algebraic geometry and show robust versions of them. So in some sense, you take a... Uh, so what we know is that up to ranks roughly n squared over 4, we know that uh, an n times n times n tensor has a unique decomposition. Can you actually show that this decomposition is stable in some sense? So in the sense that I spoke of before. So you, you take two tensors of uh, rank let's say n squared over 4 that are very close to each other, then should their decompositions be close? So this, I think, would be a really interesting problem to solve. But I mean, you probably want not just should they be close, but some 
estimate of how close, right? Right, and uh, the goal is to be polynomially uh, is to be polynomially close in the sense uh, if your error is, you know, say if your tensors are say one over n to the ten apart, then you want uh, let's say the decompositions to be one over n squared apart. Or something. So, so for starters, do we even know such a result if they're exponentially close? No, we don't. Yeah, that would be the starting point. I guess. Yeah, any, uh, I don't think there's any notion of a uh, noisy version of these uh, algebraic results that are known. And uh, that, I think, would be a very interesting thing, at least in terms of applications. All right, so let me end here. Thanks. <laughs>